Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at the europeanvc.com forward slash community. Today, we're excited to shed light on the growing phenomenon of venture builders in Europe. We've been wanting to cover this part of the industry as venture builders are becoming an increasingly used entry path into VC emerging managers, and thus a more and more common co investor investor slash co-founder for early stage VCs to work with. Our point of departure today, however, is with some seasoned vets from the venture building world, as we're talking to Stefan Ginnett and Michael Nidam, the founders of Comet Ventures. We focus first on their approach to building companies and interacting with the VC world, but the conversation quickly turns into a discussion of the venture builder model in a broader perspective. We hope you'll enjoy this deep dive and do let us know what you think. And don't forget, if you would like to suggest topics or guests for future episodes, join our community and help make the best pod for everything European VC. And if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors. Hack and Hustle's launching the second cohort of their first fundraise accelerator program tailor-made for European first-time founders about to raise their pre-seed or seed round. In 10 weeks, founders learn directly from European VC champions while they build and execute on a no BS fundraise prep that will secure them their next round of financing fast. It's up or out. If founders don't keep up the pace, they're kicked. So participation and progress is ensured for the most ambitious teams. Invite founders in your network to visit hackhustle.co and apply to get connected to the European VC. Michael and Guinea, welcome to the show. We are very much looking forward to hearing about Com Adventures and the venture builder model that you're applying. But first of all, would you tell us about your origin story? How did you come to start Com Adventures? Yeah, so thank you, Andreas, and hello, David, as well. We started Comet five years ago, as you said, as a venture builder. So our business is to build ventures. And we are both entrepreneurs, but a bit lost entrepreneurs. We are entrepreneurs in previous lives, having built several startups over the last 20 years. And I was actually back to a very large corporate called AXA, AXA Insurance Group, a member of the group executive committee and running a big business. But apart from my job, I was also a business owner, so investing in early startups. And I wanted to come back to building stuff. So not only managing big stuff, but really building stuff. So this is how the story of Kamet started, really. By joining forces with Michael and deciding that together we wanted to build and to help entrepreneurs build their own vision. I would say my set of mind at this time was very similar to the one of Stefan, who was probably a bit ahead of me in uh, trying to put together something like Kamet. I was an entrepreneur. That's how I started my career. I built a few companies. As Stefan, I was lost into a different line of business. I joined the Boston Consulting Group. I was a strategic consultant and partner there for a few years. I started to reconnect with entrepreneurship, working very closely with the digital venture. And this really triggered my appetite for going back to entrepreneurship. And uh, discussing with Stefan, who had exactly the same urge, I decided to join him on this brilliant adventure that Kamet has been and is. Let's dive right into it and talk about your investment thesis. How did you build your investment thesis and what is it exactly? Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure we have a, an investment thesis per se. First of all, we are a venture builder, which is a kind of a bit unusual type of animal in the uh, entrepreneurial world. There are entrepreneurs on one side, there are VC, you know, people providing capital. And actually, we are in between. Okay, our business is really about initiating, incubating, and launching startups. So we see ourselves much more as entrepreneurs, co-founders, you know, co-builders of ideas and businesses alongside entrepreneurs. And it happens that we have also capital and we provide alongside our own experience knowledge capabilities initial capital okay but we are really more entrepreneurs than financiers than capital providers and we don't see us as capital providers we'll come back to the business model later on but it's absolutely fundamental we are primarily entrepreneurs working with entrepreneurs and through a process which is very different from a normal entrepreneur you know a normal entrepreneur i would say we will wake up in the morning have an idea and the day after he will incorporate a business and start something we do the opposite okay we don't have ideas actually we create ideas we don't believe in the genius ideas of course there are genius ideas but we believe much more in the discipline of you know working closely 
on business concepts. So the way we do is completely different. We look at industries, we look at what we call part of value chain in given industries. And the two industries that we are really focused on are one is the healthcare industry, you know, the providing care to people. And the other one is the insurance and so-called insure tech type of industry. So we concentrate ourselves on these two already very, very big, you know, set of industry. But within these large industries, the way we do is that we look at specific topics and then we dig in many, 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 many years. We try to understand what we call the friction, but at a very, very granular level. Okay, we don't say that health tech, is, you know, healthcare is broken. Yes, it's probably broken overall, but we look at very, very granular uh, level. We do analyze all the friction in, you know, in some given part of, uh, let's say, what will become a potential opportunity. And then once we have understood very, very clearly how something works and why it's broken or why it's not optimal, then we put this on the side and then we do what we call design thinking from the ground up. Okay, so then once we have understood something like accessing a primary care in France, in rural areas, you know, whatever topic, then we understand, but very, very in details, the way it works, you know, we interview a lot of, you know, stakeholders, participants. We try to understand how value is created, you know, on patients, on doctors, on payers, on whatever. And then we put it on the side and then we start to generate concept, potential solution to a problem. And then, you know, out of this comes probably very often 10, 15, 20 different ideas. And maybe only one will be viable, both from a you know, user perspective, but also from an economic perspective, from an ability to build the right tech to deliver the promise. Because sometimes we find ideas, but we are just unable to find a good way from a technical standpoint to deliver the vision. And this process of initiating and characterizing ideas is what we call pre-solidification in our own internal, let's say, machine. It's something that takes, you know, several months. And we do it within our own factory teams, within Kamex. We have a bunch of very limited but highly expert people in design, in tech, in business model, in strategy. And we work together with entrepreneurs who, by the way, have joined us in what we call in residence. Okay, so people who want to build things, you know, but who believe that they will be more likely to be successful if they do it on a very disciplined way. So we do this constantly. We look at probably 80 ideas per annum. We work a bit more on 20 projects and we launch ultimately four to five companies. The process within Kamet is that we don't create companies initially. We work on ideas, we prototype, we test, we design, we challenge ourselves, we pivot and so on. And then once we have put together a business concept which we believe is, can be viable, that we have pre-tested, I would say they risk a lot. And once we have put together an initial, let's say, cluster of founders, you know, two, three people, and we'll come back to how we put teams together, then we decide to incorporate a business and we put a bit of capital on this business so that, you know, it's seeded and it can start to implement, you know, the vision that has been crafted within Kamet. I fully agree with Stefan. We don't have a CZs in the way uh, VC do, but we have still a few CZs, okay? Number one, I believe that it's worthwhile putting the right energy at the beginning, and we believe that in order to de-risk the rest of the roadmap. Many, many startups have to pivot out of their initial position and they end up in completely uncharted territories. And I think investing a little bit more earlier to understand a broader spectrum of the opportunity helps pivot in a much more effective manner because you very rarely pivot outside of a territory that you know. So it happens. And if you look at our ventures today, we have designed probably 20, close to 23, 24 ventures of which 20 are still active. I mean, maybe one or two pivoted out of their chartered territory. Very, very few, which on the other hand, I remember I was an entrepreneur, but I always was piloting with zero visibility and having to rediscover the environment. Every time something changed and you don't know, is it the same market? Who are the new competitors, et cetera, et cetera. And we believe that if we put the right level of investment up front, this we can avoid, which secures massively not only the design of the initial model, but also the trajectory of the company. Second thesis that personally I have is that in the traditional world, corporations and startups, they are enemies and they are antagonists. Well, maybe not enemies in the sense that they fight against each other, but they are, I would say, so estranged from one another 
that working together is toxic for both of them, and specifically for the startups. Huh? I believe there is a way to overcome this, and this requires intermediaries that understand extremely well both worlds. Very few people and very few platforms have these capabilities. A lot are trying to make that happen, open innovation platforms, etc. But genuinely understanding how does a large corporation work and how does a startup work and when can it be a click and not and help the startup go away when it's not going to click and connect when it's going to click. It's part of our thesis that it can massively accelerate and improve the quality of the innovation. For me, the third thesis is, as Stefan said, industrial. They are industries. And this is why also Kamet is built as a venture uh, builder, because our DNA is entrepreneur, but also because we started with a broader spectrum of industries. We did uh, mobility. We looked at a lot of things, energy, etc., etc. My strong belief is that there are industries that are already very well equipped to innovate without venture builders. Maybe venture builders can be successful if they have great people, but if I do a pure uh, SaaS B2B model or a pure mobility model today, you have tons of VCs that know how to analyze it, that can guide entrepreneurs that will put money very early on in those opportunities because they understand them, etc. When I do a new drug, it's not VCs that are going to finance it, it's pharma, it's R&D companies, etc. But you also have avenues to develop that. There are some fields in the innovation ecosystem that don't have those avenues. Health tech is clearly one of them. InsureTech, I believe, is one that can benefit from the platform because the level of technicity, the complexity, the speed of the sale is very, very different. And so the way you need to analyze those business models is dramatically different than a med or etc. And today, without the support of people who are well introduced, that have a real platform, that understand well the underlying of the business, that can guide the entrepreneurs, but you limit dramatically the number of people that could innovate, while with platforms like ours, but you make it possible for everybody. Huh? You're guiding us a bit through the venture building process at Camet. And a question that came to my mind is, how and when are you onboarding these entrepreneurs and residents? Because the risk I see is if they come in too late, they might feel it's not theirs. If they come in too soon, you know, and they're less experienced, it might be too uncertain. How are you dealing this, with this? What are the mechanisms that you have to make sure that they're onboarded on the right time and that they also have full ownership of the concept? Because that's really important. I mean, first of all, you should see Kamet as a kind of marketplace. You know, on one side, we source and qualify ideas, you know, concept. And on the other side, we constantly uh, talk to entrepreneurs, you know. And by the way, at lunch, why I don't want to be late, I, I uh, lunch with a, a tremendous guy that I wanted to seduce and convince that, you know, he should at some point in time partner with us. And partnering with us doesn't mean partnering on this specific ID necessary. Okay, we have people that we detect, that we select, that we believe have the right type of, you know, DNA to be good at partnering with us and building stuff. But also we like working with our type of infrastructure, you know, because some people may prefer to do it completely differently. And again, there is obviously not one single way of building successful ventures. We believe we have a kind of magic formula, but you know, it's not the only one. It works, but it's not the only one by all means. And typically, you know, when I say it's a marketplace, it means that within Kamet, entrepreneurs would have selected us and would have been selected by us, so would have access to the entire portfolio of ideas. And at some point in time, we'll hopefully fall in love with one specific ID, okay? And we'll onboard alongside our, you know, three, four, five internal factory people working on an ID and then take over uh, and progressively become the owners, I would say, internally of the ID. And there will be never an ID that is fully launched by Kamet if at some point in time an entrepreneur has not fallen in love and has taken over, you know, the ID. And it's very interesting because initially all of the IDs, you know, or 99% of the IDs come out of Kamet. And then at some point in time, after a couple of months, you know, entrepreneurs take over. And when you look at our, let's say, most mature company, the one who are three, four years down the road, they hardly, you know, remember when they talk to their team, when they talk to VC, when they talk to the market, when they talk to their customers about, you know, how they were born. And for us, this is the best proof of success. You know, on one side, we did it and we onboarded them. But on the other side, they feel probably even more owners of startups than if they had, you know, built it by their own. And they, you know, tend to almost forget about us, which is great because, as you said, we are not recruiting managers at all, okay? We are recruiting and we are partnering, I would say, with entrepreneurs that are true entrepreneurs 
and that are completely able to drive, you know, and grow these businesses. Yeah, very interesting. We could spend hours talking about this, but there's another topic that I really want to explore. And maybe then if we have time, we can come back, which is collaboration between VCs and venture builders. We mostly talk about VC in this show and our audience is used to hearing about VC and now we're bringing here the weird beast, as you said, a venture builder. And so what are your thoughts on the relationship between these two players in the ecosystems? How should VCs and VBs work together and collaborate? And what are you guys at Camet Ventures doing and or trying to develop over time? I think today the collaboration between VCs and venture builders is not yet the common practice. I would also say that fundamental difference in the way we structure a company when we are a venture builder versus how an entrepreneur standalone would structure the company, that sometimes is a bit surprising for VCs. This is the case of the way the cap table look because you have a venture builder as a founder that has an investment ticket in the company and at the same time a founder share in the company. And we see when our companies approach, you know, VC for the first time, that every time for every new VC, it's kind of a surprise. Okay, ah, but how do we manage this? Is it sufficient, the incentive? What do we need to recognize, et cetera, et cetera. Could you just expand on exactly what it is that's different about the structure and governance structure and ownership structure of going in bed with a venture-built startup rather than a normal? When I created my first company, you know, I had a partner. We were co-founders. We created the company. I had 70% of the equity. He had 30% of the equity because that's the way we decided it. We invested zero almost in the company except our time and effort, etc. We went to Business Angel, we let go 10% of the company, 15. And then the cap table, you have a passive Business Angel, very little money, a lot of bootstrapped effort, 90% of the cap table, 80% of the cap table in the hand of the founder. And that's when you approach a VC for seed money. You get the seed money. If you manage well your negotiation and you have some traction, you let go 25%, 20%, 15%, 30% of your equity. When you approach a VC for a seed extension or an A round, the founders, typically the guys who are operating, who are the managers, they still own in general, if the company is doing well, I don't know, 60%, 70%, 55%, depending on how well it has gone. When you work with a venture builder, you know, you have to consider the founders and the managers, they are two different entities, okay? Because the venture builder is the founder. You could imagine that they would create the company even before the managers join, which we don't do at Kamet at all. But you could imagine that. And so the founder part and the manager part is a bit disconnected. Also, for this very reason, the entrepreneur in residence, they are paid from the minute one when they work, etc. And so the level of bootstrapping is less. So when you look at the history of investment in the company, a company that has been venture built, in most cases would have spent in the early years, more than a bootstrapped company and would have at its cap table, yes, the angel, which is the venture builder, more or less, but also the manager, okay, but also the venture builder as a founder sitting next to the managers, okay? And so the cap table will need to acknowledge the fact that there has been a venture builder for uh, some part of the founder share and the investment profile will need to acknowledge the fact that there has been more investment because there has been less bootstrapping in the company. And this difference, you know, when a VC appreciates the efficiency of a company, they tend to look how much have they spent to get there. Uh, when you look a company on the market, there is a big chunk of how much have they spent that has disappeared because it's bootstrapping and that they don't appreciate. And when it comes from venture builder, they need to adjust and accommodate to change their lens, to change their glasses and say, okay, how much of this money actually, if I want to compare it to a standard startup, is really, you know, inefficiencies or is it only recognition of the bootstrapping that's now is in the venture building hands? The second element they need to recognize is that there is another guy at the table, which is the founder venture builder, that is there and has secured a lot of what has happened in the past that usually is not going to be dead equity at all because the level of knowledge we have in the company is massive. And so our presence along the company for at least round A and probably even round B is extremely useful to guiding the business. But, you know, typically an angel, that's not exactly the role you give him uh, in the growth of the company. So they need to change their lens, the VCs. Now, what we observe is that with the emergence of more and more venture builders that are more and more successful, we start to see VCs that know the game and that know the partition and that approach this in a much more, I would say, positive manner. And I would say the better the VC who had already dealt with a venture builder, the easier it is. I think the discussion that we have with tier one VCs that had either a file with us in the past or with another venture builder, 
have been extremely smooth compared to the one we had with companies that never had to do investment in those kind of companies because they are just puzzled and surprised by the equity structure, by the level of investment, etc., etc. Now, what we see going forward, I think VCs should accommodate to that and should have two pair of lenses because the reality is that the companies that are built by good quality venture builders are uh, on average better company than the one that on average, I'm not saying that, you know, we have more of the unicorn, but they are on average better, more solid company than the one that are self-generated. I think it would benefit VCs that they know how to close this deal faster and they look at it because today it's very clear that there are a fraction of the VCs that get frightened by this structure and that sometimes get a little bit less involved in the due diligence processes, etc., etc. for this reason very upfront. And I think it's their loss, honestly, and it would be much better if all of them were relating to those opportunities as they relate to other opportunities. I think there is another avenue for collaboration that we start to see. Okay, some VCs explore some fields and discover area where they would love to see innovation, but collaboration with the like of us could be extremely fruitful in bringing this innovation to life because if there is a real opportunity, for sure, we will be able to put something together. And we have more and more of those discussions with VCs on areas of interest where they would love to see something and they don't, and that we start to incorporate into our idea generation process. To what extent do you and Stefan go out as partners and founders of the Venture Builder and build those alliances with VCs? Or is it something that you see more as an inbound thing for you? You know, first of all, we need to acknowledge all of us that this concept of Venture Builder is still pretty new. You know, it's been around now for, let's say, the last 10 years. People like, I don't know if you know, e-founders, well-established one in France, I mean, friend of us. They started exactly 10 years ago. We started five years ago. But all of this, you know, is still pretty young, which means that, you know, they probably built like 20 ventures. We also built like 20 ventures. So, you know, there are not that many ventures out there in the market as a proportion to the, you know, thousands of startups that exist that have been built by or together with venture builders. So some VC will still have not even heard about, you know, what is this venture builder concept. Obviously, as time goes and as we see more and more tier one VC investing in absolutely extraordinary, you know, ventures built outside of uh, or together with venture builder is starting to change. But the reality is that, you know, it's still pretty new. And as always in life, you know, there is a first time with, meaning whenever you get for the first time, you know, on one of our venture, talking to VC and having finally the VC invested in one of our ventures, then it's very interesting because it will then ask proactively to get more about our portfolio ahead of, you know, future rounds and so on and so forth. And because I think he would have then understood that, as Michael said, the type of businesses that are built out of, you know, venture builders are extremely de risk. And because, you know, the fundamental economic value of what we do is that we de-risk a lot all the early stage type of phase of companies. And the best proof of this is, as Michael said, out of our 20 or so ventures that we've built over the last five years, probably only one may have died and is not even dead. <laughs> If you look a pure early stage VC, I don't know the ratio, but probably at least 50% of where I invest, you know, will be uh, written off. Yeah, and you have no VCs that invest as early as we do. So if we were able to identify at this early stage of a conception, I would suspect that the number is much, much higher than what Stephen yeah, says. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to your question, do we reach out to VC? Yes, I think we do more and more, but now we have a kind of network of either generalists or specialist VCs that know us, that have been, you know, investing in some of our ventures. I think that out of the 20, probably 15 of our ventures have raised around or beyond. Or, so we have now a very diverse set of relationships with VCs from Israel, UK, France, because as you know, we operate out of these uh, three geographies. And yes, we constantly get in touch with, you know, new VC who either reach out to us or that we reach out to because, you know, we also respect them and we value their own value add in terms of, you know, growing businesses and helping the entrepreneurs and us, you know, get to the next step. Yeah, but I would say it's a kind of a continuous discovery type of relationship. And what I can see is that for the ones who have had long-standing relationship with us, you know, they all want to make sure that whenever we have a venture that we go to the market, you know, in the next six months, they know it before the others. So that they have a chance, you know, to look at it seriously. So this is a bit the way we see it. But again, this industry of, you know, VCs is, is very large, very deep. And if your question is, are we in touch with the whole market? The answer is completely not. Do we need 
to be in touch with the whole market, the answer is completely not. Are we happy to get to know more VC? The answer is yes, because, you know, the more we are connected, the more, you know, we enlarge our ecosystem and the more it creates value to everybody. So, yeah, it's a kind of a continuous set of relationships. I would love to hear how you would put your venture builder model up against the other existing ones. For example, Rocket 47, a very big one, very esteemed one. What do you do that's different? And what do you see out there successful ones doing that you have decided not to do? Yeah, maybe I can start on this one, but Michael will know even more, you know, the other models. But there are a couple of similar models out there in each market, in each geography. And we rarely, you know, compare ourselves to others because we don't compete at all with people. You know, the more venture builders there are out there, I think the more happy we are and we genuinely believe that, you know, if we project ourselves 10 years down the road, at least for some specific industries that, you know, will benefit from the existence of this kind of animal that like we are, I think that there will be much more of this kind of models just because it creates value. It creates value and it helps create a model that likely not have existed if such kind of business model didn't exist. I think, you know, one of the particularities that Michael surfaced a minute ago, and which I believe is very unusual, is that on top of being a kind of pure venture builder, we have this fundamental knowledge that by joining forces with some very selected corporates that play a role of kind of design partner for for us and for some of our ventures, we believe that the outcome of what we do is even better. So I think that... When I look at, maybe not the model that you mentioned, but some models that I look at and that are also very successful, like like Amet, I think this is something very different. We tend to try to not only build startups, but build startups and join forces and collaborate with established organizations, and especially in the early phases. Because this large organization, uh, especially in the healthcare domain, whether they are HMOs, whether they are, you know, uh, providers of care, you know, hospitals, whether they are, um, you know, uh, pharma companies, whether they are, uh, you know, tech companies in the medical space, you know, they have a lot of data, they have a lot of business expertise, they have practitioners, you know, doctors, nurses, uh, they have patients. <laughs> so when it comes to designing and testing and crafting new concepts, you are much faster, much better when you manage to do it jointly with a partner, with an agile partner. It has to be agile and it has to be able to work with young ventures, but you are much faster and much more efficient when you do it jointly with a partner. And we tend, not all of our businesses have been built, you know, in this kind of framework, but quite a few have benefited a lot from an early strategic collaboration with a large HMO or a large industrial player. And I think that, you know, our own profile, both Michael and I, having been entrepreneurs, having been business angels, but also having been either, you know, partner at BCG, so working with large corporate on one side, or me, ex-com member of a 100 billion company like AXA, we know a bit how to make these two worlds, you know, startup and large corporate work, or at least we know how to identify, you know, the situation where it's worth investigating and collaborating on a win-win basis and when it's due to fail. And on many occasions, it's due to fail. Because, as Michael said, very often the relationship is a bit toxic just because, you know, the setup is not the right one. But when you find the sweet spot on both sides, you can really create amazing opportunities very, very fast. And I have an example in mind that maybe we'll discuss that I very often give as an example, which is around Ibex Medical, which was built, you know, with a very large HMO in, in Tel Aviv. And what they managed to build in the design phase. So it's a digital pathology company, you know, analyzing biopsies and using machine learning and deep learning techniques to automate a diagnosis of cancer by analyzing a biopsies. Beyond the fact that the idea is great, beyond the fact that the, the two co-founders are absolutely perfect and superstar, if they were not able from day one to access, you know, millions of data sets, if they were not able from day one to work, you know, and by end with pathologists at this organization and design the product so that it fits the needs of these pathologists. What has taken them, you know, probably a year to build would have taken them probably three years and they would have probably failed. 
So there are many examples, and we could give you know many other examples of situation, what I would call a smart collaboration between an established uh, incumbent and a bunch of entrepreneurs can prove to be you know, extremely uh, win-win for both organizations. And especially when you deal with complex industries like healthcare, you know, uh, or like insurance, which is extremely complicated, it helps a lot when you manage to find the right partnership from your, almost from day one or almost from day minus one. One thing that I want to emphasize, you know, I said that for years I was lost in consulting. The reality is, if I look retrospectively at my career, I think if you're able to perform in both environments, you're adding a lot to uh, both environments, okay? I fully agree with Stefan that one of the specificity of Kamet is that the leadership here is versatile and understands very well how to thrive in a corporate world and how to thrive in an entrepreneurial world. And this is very, very specific about us. I'm not sure how the other uh, venture builder rank on this dimension, but very clearly, that's one edge that we play on. In our intro talks, I think it was you, Michael, you um, talked a bit about portfolio management in the sense that you guys have, and I hope I'm using the right words, uh, you have more of a patrimonial approach towards the portfolio. I'd love to hear you talk about that so our audience understands what you mean and how you guys as a venture builder look at the portfolio of companies as a whole. Listen, the, the logic that we are, as we said, we are entrepreneurs. We are entrepreneurs who don't have a garage, we have a studio, but we are entrepreneurs. And so when we built a company, of course, we have a financial interest in the company, but we have a very strong affectio societatis in the company. We like the company we built, we consider them as a our babies, exactly like the entrepreneurs that build them. So we know that the destiny of every company is not the same, okay? If you really believe that there is something to fix in a hospital and you create a new hospital, maybe you're very happy about that, but you know that it's not a company to be invested by index. Nevertheless, we will look for the right trajectory for this company because we care about its development. We know that the return profile are not going to be the same. And very often, we know that even from the day one. There are some companies in our portfolio that we know are not companies that are going to reach huge valuation, but are companies that should deliver very sizable uh, dividends if they work well. We know from the get-go that some companies will struggle a bit more on having exponential growth on their top line, but they should manage to achieve extraordinary profit level on their bottom line. And we know that the type of investor that will be needed to support those companies along their journey is not always the same. We are evergreen at Kamet. That's when I said patrimonial in the, what I meant is we are evergreen. There are some companies where we see a normal pass that VC will look three years, four years, grow secondary, or uh, maybe seven years IPO. Or, and then there are companies we believe have other trajectories and can be extremely successful in a different model where probably less dilutive financing will be put at play or more strategic partner will be involved, etc. We are supportive of all the models. Okay, so when we build something where we know there is a business, of course, if it fails and it doesn't find its place and there is no product market fit like everybody at some point, we have to recognize that we failed. But if it's failing because it doesn't fit in one avenue, we are not trying to make it fit in this avenue or die. We are happy to explore different avenues to bring the company to success. That's interesting because you're touching on a point I feel like many people who are less exposed to the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem and even the venture ecosystem as a whole don't really understand <laughs> that, you know, it's different risk profiles, different ways to develop the companies. As an entrepreneur, I played this VC route in one of my companies that failed. And my other companies, I never played this VC route. My first company was on payment security, etc. I had a first ticket from a small fund, thanks to Stefan, by the way, many, many years ago who I think he doesn't even remember, but made an intro to me. <laughs> First, Those are the best ones. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> and this company got, uh, you know, angels, early VC money, and we, we couldn't succeed. Okay, we couldn't succeed. I think we developed something that was great technically, but we didn't have the right experience to succeed. My two other companies, you know, I did very nice exit, nothing like the one that you see on the first page of whatever tech magazine, et cetera, et cetera, but very nice exit, but I was still owning, you know, 50% of the equity. And through a VC route on a very nice exit, it's extremely rare. Typically, you can't achieve that because the companies that I built, they were operating companies, sizable margin, quick to profitability, nice growth pattern, not 100% per year, 50% per year after year two. No VC would have invested in them, a lot of people working, a lot of process, etc. Now, banks, family offices, private investors, etc., they were very happy with this. 
they put the money, they had a time three. I was very happy as an owner of these companies and I had sizable dividends, etc., etc. And these companies were very innovative. Ultimately, two years down the road after two purchases, the core tech has been uh, built at a much higher multiple than what I managed to do. But it took 15 years, okay? This trajectory, it also exists for companies and entrepreneurs. We acknowledge it at Kamet. We know that there is one way, which is the VC, you know, bursting, huge success, very dilutive, companies that are super visible. We know that there are other trajectories. And when I look at my entrepreneurial friends, I have many, many, okay? I always find the people who like the VC route and want to do that, and you have people who absolutely want to avoid that. Me, I believe that in Kamet, because we built a lot of those companies and two-thirds or three-fourths of the companies goes the VC route, of course, we have a much more exposure to this one. And so what I said about collaborating with VC, I still believe is very important. For entrepreneurs that join forces with us, it's not the only route we favor. It's not the yeah. only way we see innovation and successful businesses to be launched. That was actually my question, which is a while ago, we biased the conversations towards VCs, but now I want to step back and I want to ask, are you strategic in Kamet about the type of development path that you want your companies to have so that you're proactively thinking of, will it be a VC company, will it not be a VC company in the sense of creating balance? Or are you more strategic about, you know, we really want to find core problems within the space and then to solve that, whatever happens, happens and we'll deal with it. To which side do you feel more inclined? It's clearly the second one. You know, when we look at something, a space, and we believe, you know, there is something to do once we have found a good way of solving a problem, whether, you know, ultimately it will be a VC player or not a VC player, I would say it's secondary. Even if, you know, in the type of problem that we look at, type of opportunities, most of what we do hein, is very attractive potentially to VC. You know, we have a topic right now as we speak where it's much more, you know, the family uh, office, you know, again, very, very nice business, sizable, but yes, a kind of trajectory which is probably less explosive. But again, it's not because this is a case that will not be interested at all. I would say that's almost the opposite. A posteriori, sometimes we look at it and we say, ah, it's good to have one or two more of those opportunities, but we always fail to be strategic about the way we design. We design to solve solutions. Yeah. And then we look a posteriori, you know, of, you know, in the portfolio and so on. And it happens that, yes, there is some kind of diversification in terms of risk return profile and so on and so forth. But again, you know, unlike the early stage VC who will make 10 bets and their return ultimately will be much more about one or two companies really getting to the roof, our fundamental business is much more than, you know, most of our companies will exit. Some will exit, you know, at very, very, very nice uh, three uh, or even maybe four digit, you know, figures. Maybe, you know, we don't have yet a unicorn, but I'm sure we have a couple of companies that may become a unicorn. But we have already four companies that are over, you know, 100 million. And to make our business extremely profitable, we don't need, you know, to get to 1 billion at all. You know, so again, it doesn't mean that, we are not very happy if some, you know, of these companies uh, have this kind of trajectory, but this is not at all the only way to create absolute, you know, great multiples, especially when you start like us, you know, from the origin. And, you know, when I look at my own experience as a business angel, I have been investing in probably 15 companies on many, many examples I did over seven, eight, ten times when, you know, the VC did two, did three. Because again, when you invest very, very early on at, uh, I mean, extremely low valuation, you have a risk, you know, return profile, which is completely different. So if you are able to de-risk a lot and therefore to keep a very low death rate and a very high survival rate, then you create an overall return, which is just fantastic. Hein? Again, uh, all of what we do is still quite early on, but we really believe that doing well what we do can be extremely uh, value creating. I'm curious to ask you about the uh, societal side of this question about whether you go the VC route or you go something that's, you might call it less ambitious or at least less scalable. I really see that in these times, everyone are talking about going the VC route, doing something that will be the next Facebook or UiPath or something like that. But it's just as honorable 
and it's much more achievable to most to build something that's going to be a solid business and that will exit or maybe not even exit, but just be a good cash cow for you the rest of your life. What are your views on that? Are you experiencing the same thing that everyone is being told you need to build big or go home? Yeah, but again, you know, when you look at even from a founder perspective, you know, it's better to exit at 200 million and still owning 15% or 20% of your company. So making 30, 40 million than to end at 1 billion with less than 1% or 2%. I know today there is, I mean, as you know, billions, trillions of capital that is being invested in startups. Again, there are some models that require hundreds of millions of capital and that have a market potential which can drive multi-billion, multi-tens of billion valuation. And there are a few businesses like this, a few tens of businesses, maybe a few hundred of businesses like this in the world. But the big bulk is not there. You know, the big bulk is to build multi-hundred million companies. And if, you know, entrepreneurs can do this by raising capital, because purely self-finance businesses like this rarely exist, unfortunately, but this mix of how much capital you will have burned, how much dilution you will have needed versus what type of exit can you make, is a fundamental question. And I remember very well one situation where uh, I was part of a very successful exit in France. You know, the entrepreneur had failed, actually, his previous startup, so it was a bit scary about his own future, you know, about his own liquidity, his own uh, security. And ultimately, he raised, well, he was very successful. He sold at, let's say, a bit more than 100 million, you know, which is a very good exit. You know, it's not a Facebook, but still, it's a very good exit after four or five years. But he had raised too much money, you know, in his last round. So he probably gave away 30, 40 percent too much versus as a net outcome for him than if he had done slightly differently. So again, this debate is a, you know, very interesting debate. What we just say is that Yes, we are very ambitious. Most of what we do has the potential of becoming uh, very, very big businesses. By the way, this is why quite a few of our ventures, you know, have attracted capital from uh, some of the best names in the market, but not all of them. And from an entrepreneur perspective, you know, I don't know which one will end up the best solution. You know, the future will say, but there is not only one way to do things. And yes, I agree with you. I think these days we are a bit overwhelmed by uh, overexposed, you know, to only these few kind of iconic uh, multi hundred million raise, uh, multi billion valuation. You know, all the story about this, all this liquidation preference, all of this stuff. So again, it's more complicated. The reality is that you need to have a good vision. If you build something solid, you'll be good at the end of the day. So there is not only one type of model. And I think that the spectrum of innovation is much more than just trying to find the future Facebook. May I answer on the societal aspect, uh, completely independent from Kemet, from Venture Builder, etc. I mean, you know, people believe that impacting society is about being massive. I see that every time, you know, I discuss that with my kids, you know, say, ah, if you're having a shop where you live, you know, in the suburb of London, you impact much less society than if you have TikTok. That's a discussion I have at dinner with my kids, so sorry uh, to bring it here. But me, I have a very different perspective. I think in innovation, what matters is to have as many people as possible bringing their effort into changing the world. It's not about having very, very big change. It's about having a lot of people finding that innovation, startup, building new stuff is the way that's going to make their own life successful. I believe that if you want to do that, you cannot bet only on the massive animal, etc., etc. There will be very few. They are consolidators. And I also strongly believe that it goes against what's happening in the society today. One of the investment theses I could have mentioned before, I didn't because I wanted to be selective, is that I personally strongly believe in exponential organizations. I strongly believe in a world that's more and more open, where people are more and more independent, where they work for themselves more than for institutions. The previous link of employer-employee, I mean, is something that has been really hit very hard by the newer generations. And if we are going this direction, it's not for people to have always, you know, successes that irradiate the whole world and being Facebook is by everybody being able to stand for himself and develop his innovation. And it will never succeed with only a one size fits all model. That's I'm very sure of it. And so models like ours that open up, you know, the new venues for new people to innovate, to participate in this, I think are extremely uh, positive for the society.
Uh, Michael, before we close it, I have to take your example because there's also the whole conversation about if we ignore the nice marketing phrases that all these big unicorns and big companies have and we truly look at what they're doing, you know, I am 100% sure that the small shop or the small deli close to London in the suburbs is actually having more impact or positive impact <laughs> than TikTok, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't want to say that. I don't want to insult. I, I will. <laughs> uh, guys, it was great having you. There were a lot of topics that we could have explored, like building remote, because you guys have several locations, how to find people and source talent and onboard them into new ventures. There's a lot of stuff we didn't talk about, but it was great. We're running out of time. Thank you very much for accepting the challenge. We're looking forward to launching the episode. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à vous. It was really a great discussion, a very open, uh, with no bullshit, you know, really straight talk. We've tried to be genuine. Uh, you know, as we are. And thank you for giving us the opportunity and looking forward to the outcome. So thank you. Take good care. Have a good day and, uh, and talk to you soon again. Absolutely. Have a great day, guys. Take care. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you would like to suggest topics or guests for future episodes, join our community and help make the best pod for everything European VC. And if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors.